that flow to us without interruption so that more and more we may be able to see we have received out of the fullness of Christ grace upon grace. We know these truths intellectually. May we live them. May they become a part of the way in which we think. May they guide our feelings, controlling them, directing them. And especially may the feeling of gratitude grow that such sinners so loved and so saved may be guided so to serve. We gather here this first Sabbath of the day of the year. But we start a new week too. We want to start it here in the consciousness that Thou dost give us of the relationship Thou didst eternally determine to establish with us, aware of Thy control, but especially aware that this is the day of the week on which Jesus arose from the dead as the evidence that He truly did finish His work of earning pardon for every sin of all of thy elect children. And that we may, in that awareness, go forth now. But before we can, we need to be fueled, as it were, by thy word. We need to be reminded and taught. We need to have these truths impressed upon us. So, Father, take thy, may thy Holy Spirit impress on our souls, into our minds, our understandings, upon our whole being, truths. Truths that are important to guide us for this week and this year. So that we may be the better equipped to serve Thee. We thank Thee that there are ways in which we can serve Thee all the time. May we not only think of what we humanly would judge as the big ways. May we realize that the attitudes that we have when we wake up in the morning, the words that we say or sometimes don't say in the car as we come to worship, are all ways in which we are in thy service. That the way in which we greet each other, that with hearts sincere we sing with understanding the words that the psalmists have written and now are versified for us to praise thy name, to remind us as this last number did of thy great faithfulness so that it is with only fear and reverence that we come before thy feet and meet in worship before thee, knowing that more than all about thy throne thou must be feared and thou alone. Bless us so that we may serve thee now in our old relationships and in new ones. In the old ones where we take things for granted, may we no longer do that. May we receive each other in our own homes as gifts. Each moment is a new gift in that relationship that thou dost give. Just as thy mercy is fresh and new every morning, so it comes to us through these relationships. 
But mercy is that powerful pity, that desire on thy part that is fulfilled, that desire to bless the miserable. So as we stand before thee, unworthy, may we see gifts from thee in these relationships. Maybe we don't appreciate them. Reconstruct our thinking. Fix our perspectives. Reset our priorities. Thou art able. May our gratitude for the grace, for the mercy that's given and that's promised be that powerful motive to bend our hard wills, our stubbornness, our self-pity. Shape us, Father. Shape us to do Thy will. Give Thy blessing to us as we realize we are a part of the body not just in our homes, but as a part of the body of Jesus Christ. Teach us about the church again this morning. May we see her as a glorious body. Eventually, thou art working to make her eventually be without spot or without wrinkle. and That she will be the assembly of the elect in ages to come. But now she walks as a church through the midst of this world, but she's a bridegroom, a bride prepared for the bridegroom. May we consciously live as a part of that beautiful bride ordained to an eternal marriage to Jesus Christ, but engaged in such a way that nothing can break that engagement. We thank Thee for this congregation. We thank Thee for each other. This morning we thank Thee for those men who served for three years in the office of elder and deacon, giving of themselves, sometimes in the most difficult decisions, but giving themselves to the whole working with the others to make decisions, to discuss, sometimes to cry together, and sometimes to laugh together. We thank Thee for them. We thank Thee for their wives and their children who gave and thus served the whole as well in the giving of their husbands in time, and in other ways for the cause of thy church here. May we all give that way. And in giving, may we receive. Receive assurances of thy care. Receive assurances of that unfailing love. Bless us. Hear our prayer, forgive the sins of it. Keep by thy spirit sin from interfering much with our hearing of thy word. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen. Let's give now for the cause, first of all, the general fund, and then secondly, for that of benevolence.
Let's read the Word of God now as we find it in the book of Acts of the Apostle of Christ through the Apostles. Book of Acts, chapter 2. This chapter begins with the history of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, which Peter explains, um, especially in verses 29 and following, to the audience. He does it particularly in verse 33. He hath received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, and he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Let's begin to read at verse 37. Acts 2, beginning at 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were gathered together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. May God bless our reading of his word. The passage that we will be looking at a bit later, as it comes to us from this portion of God's word, is found in verse 42. There we read, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. We consider this morning the fourth attribute of the church. We continue our consideration of question and answer 54 of Lord's Day 21 about the Holy Catholic Church. And let's read that one more time that the Son of God, from the beginning to the end of the world, gathers, defends, and preserves to himself, by his Spirit and Word, out of the whole human race, a church chosen to everlasting life, agreeing in true faith, and that I am, and forever shall remain, a living member thereof. The church is one. That's the first that we considered of the four attributes. It is holy and it is Catholic. Those three we're very familiar with because they're a part of the Apostles' Creed. The, this fourth attribute, that she is an apostolic church, 
is something that we confess in the Nicene Creed, our ecumenic, one of our ecumenical creeds. We believe in holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Rome, the Church of Rome, always interprets this apostolicity of the church to be something that's physical and visible. That's what they had in common with all the other four. They believed that they have to be visible and physical. And then they say they are apostolic because of a succession of the persons of the apostles. So they would look at what we call the Pope and identify that as the apostolic seat. That's the continuation of the apostles from Peter on. One after another, that is the apostolicity of the church. The reformers said about all four attributes. No, they're not just to be identified with something physical and visible. The Attributes of the church are to be seen as spiritual realities. Now, one, that's easy to get. The church of Jesus Christ, as it's been elect, is one whole. Makes up the body of which Jesus is the head. Catholic means that it's not just one part of, that the body of Christ is not made up of one, just one thing, a leg or an eye, but rather the body is made up of many different kinds of parts throughout all ages. Holiness of the church means that as it exists in the midst of this world, it's not worldly, it's not common, but it's been separated. It may just like the vessels of the temple and tabernacle, be an ordinary thing otherwise, but when it's given into the service of God, then it's holy. It's to be devoted to His worship, to His cause. What do we mean by the apostolicity of the church if it's not a succession of persons, as the Church of Rome says? Well, the apostolicity of the church that we believe we are a part of the apostolic church is this. It is a succession of the truth. Not a succession of the persons of apostles, but it's a succession of the truth. This church we just confessed out of the Lord's Day 21 is something that is gathered from the beginning to the end, agreeing in true faith. Agreeing in true faith. It's that phrase out of our beloved Heidelberg Catechism that speaks to this truth of the apostolic nature of the church, even today. Even today. There's just two points that we have in this sermon. The first is the meaning of that. And then finally the implications. And we'll draw five implications. In understanding the idea of the apostolic nature of the church, we're going to look at three different passages of the Word of God. And the first one is that which we have in front of us here in Acts chapter 2. These newly baptized Christians, at this time, Jews, just about all were Jews, who were converted from the concept of Old Testament Jewishdom that would refuse to acknowledge Jesus to be the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Christ, but now are converted from that to this belief that Jesus is the Christ. That's the heart of the apostles' 
doctrine. But notice, they continued steadfastly, verse 42 says, in the apostles' teachings. That's literally the word that's translated doctrine in the New Testament. They continued in the apostles' teachings. So immediately we have a, an answer to Rome. It's not a succession of persons. It's a succession of teachings apostolic teachings. Now, do a quick read through the book of Acts and follow the Apostle Paul as he went from place to place. Peter first in Acts 10 when he spoke to Cornelius. But then Paul in Antioch, in Thessalonica, and in other places, and listen to how he preached. And then you get the apostles' teachings. This can be highlighted in Acts 17. Acts 17. Here we get what was the ordinary teaching of the apostle Paul. We find in verse 2 that it was his manner, his custom, that he went in unto the synagogue of the Jews, verse 1 tells us, on three Sabbath days, and this is what he did, he reasoned, he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ, is the Messiah. So this is a good example of the apostles' teachings. If you go back to Acts 2, you find that what these new Christians did was this. This is, this is how they're identified. He's just said that about 3,000 new ones were added to this now the Christian church in Jerusalem. Surrounded by all Jews, they themselves in their nationality are Jews, but now they identify themselves as the followers of Christ. Later on, they're first called Christians at Antioch, but that's what they really are already. They're the followers of Christ. They're the Christian church at Antioch. What characterizes this church? Well, we've got many things that are given, many things that are described. They had a great relationship with each other. They broke bread. They prayed together. They looked at their possessions as not necessarily first their own, but if they saw a need, as need arose, they would give of their own possessions for the sake of the other. They had things in common. They, lived to, they didn't live together, but they treated their relationship together as if they were one. They enjoyed each other. Another characteristic is that the fear of God was present among them. They were in awe of God. Their understanding of God was not as it was among the Jews and as it had been for them, merely an intellectual apprehension of some sort of activity that they had to do, but now fear dwells within their hearts. Fear is not something you do externally. Fear is a, the fear of God is a matter of one's heart, one's attitude. They stood in awe of the God of the Scriptures and the gift that that God had given them in His Son, Jesus, whom they believed to be the Old Testament promised Messiah. But while these other characteristics of that church are there, and you can even go to verse 47 and see that this is a church that was growing. God was adding to it daily. The chief, the chief characteristic of the Christian church, because it's the very first thing that's mentioned, is this. They continued 
steadfastly in the apostles' teachings. When it's added steadfastly, when that adjective is added to their relationship to these truths, or it's an adverb, I believe now, an adverb describing how they continued in those apostles' teachings, then realize that the word steadfastly implies that they faced challenges. They faced dangers. They faced temptations to swerve from it. They had to be committed. And they had to recommit themselves. We're going to know and we're going to adhere to these teachings of the apostles. That Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ who the Old Testament scripture said contrary to anything that the Jews had believed and the apostles initially had believed, had to die and rise again. And he will come again. And this wasn't just among the apostles. These are the children. These are all the members of the congregation of that church. This is their activity. Just as the fear of God was their activity, just as their relationship with each other, of one of harmony, was their activity, so this continuing steadfastly in the apostles' teachings was the activity of all the members. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle, at the end of that chapter, we read this last week, talks about the union now in the church at Ephesus, the Christian church at Ephesus. Now the Christian church at Ephesus has Jews and Gentiles that are both converted, converted out of relationships where, especially from the viewpoint of the Jews, they hated those Gentiles, and the Gentiles aren't too fond of the Jews initially either, but now that they're converted, the, the wall that divided them is broken down. Now there's peace that's in them. Christ is our peace. He's made both one, broken down the wall of partition between us, abolished in his flesh the enmity, the hatred that we formerly had with each other. Now, at the end of that chapter, Ephesians 2, he says, You are no more strangers and foreigners, but altogether your fellow citizens with the saints. You are of the household of God. And then he adds this, verse 20, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So if Acts 2, verse 42, talks about the teachings of the apostles, let's take that idea and let's look at that idea here as it's described as the foundation of the church. So now Paul's drawing another picture, a figure. He's building a building. That building is the church. Jew and Gentile in it. But he wants to say, if you go below the surface, the visible surface, and you look at that which is the foundation of the church, then the foundation of the church, he says, is the apostles and prophets. First, the word prophets. Not Old Testament prophets, but New Testament prophets. This is what he meant in, the, in two chapters later, Chapter 4, he gave, Jesus ascended to give gifts. He gave apostles, prophets, and evangelists. So apostles were the twelve. Evangelists were assistants to the apostles. Prophets, if you look in the book of Acts 12 and again in, in chapter 13, they were those who are identified as those who assisted and helped 
the prophets, the apostles, and the evangelists. So they're New Testament prophets. But he says, now the foundation of this church that's being built, not only in Ephesus, but everywhere else, has the apostles and prophets. Now that's not to be understood as their persons. Remember, we've got Acts 2.42. It's the teachings of the apostles and prophets. But what we're given to understand now is this. Here's the new thing we get from Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 2. The church, the body of Jesus Christ, is to have as one of its attributes that it is an apostolic church. Then and today. So that we want, if we dig below the building of the church, we want to find the apostles' teachings are alive and well. They're here. What the apostles and prophets taught Now, by the grace of God, the verbal instructions that the apostles and prophets and evangelists gave, again, now look at Ephesians chapter 2, or 4 rather. If apostles, prophets, evangelists are gifts that Jesus gave to the church, and those gifts are now fulfilled because the apostles are gone, evangelists and prophets are gone, but what's left is pastors and teachers. So, not the persons of pastors and teachers, but the teachings of pastors and teachers is to be, if it's the true church of Christ, a continuation of the apostles' teachings about Christ. Now, thankfully, every one of us has the ability to judge whether a pastor, teacher, is laying, building on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Because now the teachings of the apostles and prophets is given to you in all of the New Testament Scripture. And we could go through 2 Peter, 1 Corinthians, and there's other passages that we can give you. And if you want them, I'll give you the references later where you can see that they laid a foundation that's now incorporated in the New Testament Scriptures as a continuation of the old, as an enlightenment of the old. And then we may say, this, as it's taught, is the apostolic foundation. But in order for that to be true, and, and the church is still apostolic, is this, is what's being taught and preached by pastor teacher out of here. Does it proclaim Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah? Those are the traditions. Those are the ordinances that Paul left he said it in 1 Corinthians. He said it in Titus. These are the things you must teach. Is If that's being taught today, then we may say that's an apostolic church. It's a part of the whole because the teachings of the apostles are alive and well there. The third passage we want to go to is 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3. In verse 15, he's given direction about what, qualifi what qualifies someone to be an elder, and then a deacon. Then he says, verse 14, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, 
the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. This, this is what you must do. This is how you ought to behave in a godly way. This is the revelation of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. But it's at that last part of verse 15 that we come, why we come to this passage. I write these things about what qualifies somebody to be an elder, a deacon. I hope to relate them in person soon. But if I tarry long, how thou oughtest conduct thyself in the church of God, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And then he says this. That church of the living God is the pillar and ground of the truth. What does he mean by that? Now, Ephesians 2, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the teachings of them. Now he says, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Pillars Hold up not only is the truth of God's Word, the heart of which Jesus is Christ, not only is that truth of God's Word to be that on which the church is built, but in addition, a church is an apostolic church when it displays is the pillar and ground of the truth. This is what we're learning. The instituted church is there for the sake of the truth not the truth for the sake of the church. God doesn't give us his truth. And it's for us, the church. No, he gives us the truth so that we can display that truth. More important than the church is the truth. The truth about God. The truth about Christ. That's more important than the body of Christ. The instituted body of Christ. The church of the living God is to consciously display, hold up, proclaim the truth of God's word. The church exists Precisely to show forth God and his Christ. And the chief way it does that is when the preaching of the gospel is according to the word of God. It's not about us. That's why, that's why the display of the marks of the true church, chief of which is the preaching, the faithful preaching of the pure doctrines of the gospel. Has yet to make any of the members better. Better Christians. Doesn't do that. We like to think it does. We would hope it would. But there's no automatic connection. The better the truth is faithfully preached makes the people better. 
that sometimes an accusation, you think you're better because you say the truth that is preached in your church is the better. That's a false argument. But we may never act or conduct ourselves as if it's true. We are. No, it's not about us. The church exists. I am a part of the church whereof I am a living forever member of the body of Jesus Christ is so that we can display God in Christ in all his beauty and not display us. The pillar in the ground. Sometimes if you look at antebellum homes in the south, then you see, man, you can identify them right away because of those pillars, those beautiful white pillars on the front porches. And they get the attention. The concept of the ground the pillar and ground of the truth is that the pillar and the ground is something you don't see. You don't see it. It's just like the foundation. It's below the surface. We're not there to display ourselves. You don't want the foundation to be seen. You want the building to be seen. And that which is to be seen, according to this passage of the Word of God, is the truth about God as you find it in, in verse 16. Okay, Acts 2.42, Ephesians 2.20, and now 1 Timothy 3.15 and 16. This is the apostolicity of the church. There is a succession of the truth of God that must be alive and well for a church to be the church of Jesus Christ. What are the implications? First, the Belgian Confession tells us that we are called to be a member of the church, to join ourselves to the church to a local congregation. The determination of which local congregation I am to join myself to is this. This is my and must be my consideration. Well, that's where my husband wants to go. No. They've got the nicest building. No. They're the friendliest people. No. They're growing. No. The identification of the church to which I am called to join myself according to the Belgian Confession, every Christian is, is that church which is apostolic. It proclaims as the church of all of the new dispensation has faithfully the pure doctrines, the pure teachings of the Word of God. They continue in the apostles' teachings. What destroys a church? is that it fails to maintain and proclaim the apostles' teachings. That means this. This is the second implication. The church that is truly apostolic, a continuation, is going to do everything it can to uphold the Word of God. This is where the apostles' teachings are contained. Even to the extent that it defends a version of the English translation of the Word of God. 
but it's going to defend and maintain the truth as it's found in God's Word. It wants to keep that precious deposit of the truth. It will make that the content of what's taught in the catechism room and from the pulpit. It doesn't want to hear a commentary on current events. It doesn't want to hear feel-good messages. It wants to hear God's word opened and explained. Exactly what Paul did at the church at Thessalonica. He opened and alleged that Christ must need suffer and die and rise again. Opening and alleging. Reasoning out of the scriptures. That's the maintenance of the word of God. Third implication. God isn't doing this for the first time. This is what apostolic really emphasizes. It's a succession. We're not coming on the truth today. You and I, as individuals, may be living in the last part of this decades and, and these last few decades, and we may say, well, here we are from 1950 onward, and now in the early parts of the 21st century, here we are. This is where we are. Yes, but apostolic teachings means we're not the first ones. This has been around for a while. And, and just as we're coming to know it and learn it and appreciate it and love it even, so if we would go back a hundred years, we'd find people who were just like us, dressed a little differently, maybe living in a different part of the world, maybe even a different language, but they came on those same truths the same way we are now. And we go back another year, hundred years before that, and we find they were doing the same thing. And another hundred, yes, That's where we find these creeds. We call them three forms of unity. Those th creeds unite us with the apostles. Because while the revelation of God that he gives in the Bible is from one day to the next, it's a revelation in history. The creeds take these truths that are revealed to us from day to day, one day after the other, one year after another. They take these truths and they summarize them. What was said about God? What was said about the church? What was said about Christ? What was said about justification? What's said about sanctification? What's said about a good work? Out of all of the Bible, and it says, this is what it says about this truth, and this is what all the Word of God says about this truth, and this is what it says about that truth, and it puts it together in an organized way. That's the creeds. So the creeds are a way to identify apostolic succession. Are we an apostolic church? Would be answered this way. What value do they put on the creeds? Now, they're not going to value them in such a way that they say they're equal in authority to the Bible. Absolutely not. Nor are they going to so value those creeds that they say the creeds add to the truth of the Bible. No. But they're going to hold those creeds up because Jesus promised just before he was crucified and 50 days before he poured out the Spirit, that he would send that Spirit of truth. Aha! The Spirit, not just the Spirit, but the Spirit of truth. John 16. Who would lead the church into all truth. He may lead us, but he's led the church of the past into the truth too. And he's done that in the creeds. So an apostolic church is not going to 
well, those are stuffy and those are old and those are unimportant. The apostolic church of today is going to take out and say, what did the spirit of truth reveal from the word of God to the church of the past? Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. Okay? There's not an error There's not a way that the devil is attacking today that he didn't use in the past. How did they handle him? How did they handle that error, that heresy in the past? Let's learn and let's stand on the shoulders of the church of the past. What did they say about Jesus being divine? So we go to the Athanasian Creed. We go to the other creeds. What did they say about the Holy Spirit? We go to those creeds. What did they say about the church? That's why we have and have for 500 years preach the catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Word of God from the perspective of the Heidelberg Catechism. You're not preaching men's words, you're preaching God's word as the Spirit has led the church of the past into it. So we value the creeds as an expression of self-consciousness. How does the church grasp the truth? How did it in the past? That would be a good guide for us today. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to start from scratch. Let's examine what they did in the light of the Word of God, but let's take what they did that's in harmony with the Word of God and go from there. What does the church believe about election? What did the apostles teach? You go to the Bible. But the way to go to the Bible is, let's first find out what they said it says, and then let's go to this, and let's find out. Then we are an apostolic church, agreeing in true faith with the church of the past, and we're one with them. The creeds show to those outside of the church, what do you believe? There's all kinds of places here that say church. This whole community is full of churches. What's the differences? Take out your creeds and they say, this is how we take the word of God to be properly understood. Here's our identification. The creeds defend the faith against previous heresies which repeat themselves so often. There's a lot of talk today about federal vision, the error of federal vision. The church has treated it in the past in every bit. There's an answer. We bring it out. We highlight it. As the error highlights itself, we have an answer found in the creed. Fourth implication is this. In Acts 2, where the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, we read this in verse 47. And the Lord added to that church the ones he was saving. That's the correct way to translate the last part of verse 47. The Lord added to the church daily... The ones being saved. You want church growth? Go get a snappy preacher. Get an orator. No. Get a screen and entertainment. No. You want church growth? The Lord added to the church that continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine the ones he was saving. 
so may we carry on that responsibility. That's not everything, but that's going to be a chief part of church growth. You don't forsake the apostolicity of the church in order to grow. The apostolicity of the church is foundational for church growth. Last, personal implications. If this truth of the apostolic church is that important, then may I learn this, and may we all learn this. I want to learn more and more about that God. And I'll learn it correctly. Here's the test if I'm getting it. I'll grow in fear of Him. Not terror, but awe. But I've got this problem in my life, okay? Learn what did the church and the children of God in the past. I'm not facing a problem that God's people haven't faced before. How did they answer it? How did they deal with it? I've got a marriage problem. I've got a problem with a child. I've got a problem with a parent. I've got a problem with an employee. How did the church of the past face that? It all starts with an awe of an awesome God. Then let me grow in understanding those teachings of the apostles as they are now found in the written Word of God. Let me cultivate an interest in them. Let me dig into them. Let me learn to mine and find the nuggets, the gold and the silver that's so precious and valuable so that I may declare His glory the more. The second implication is this. We love, at the time of the Reformation, as a reformational church too, to sing that hymn that speaks of the faith of our fathers. That's a good hymn, and it's a great line. The faith of our fathers living still, in spite of dungeon, terror, and sword. To be an apostolic church means, one, we know, understand, and appreciate the faith of our spiritual fathers. Not physical fathers, spiritual fathers, the apostles. We understand those truths. But wait a minute. Our grasp of them isn't just an intellectual thing that we can write about and, and talk about. It's to be lived. The faith of our fathers lives. As much as the blood flows through the veins of my body and as much as the nerves connect themselves to each other and I'm alive! So the truth of Jesus Christ, Savior from sin, my shepherd, my rock, my fortress, my hope, and so many more, that lives. That gives me peace and quiet in my soul. That gives me strength when there's a hill I've got to climb. That's what guides my tears. It doesn't take them away, but it guides them in sorrow. That's what helps me to laugh to the glory of God and to rejoice 
in my being under him and in his lordship. May the truth live. The truth that the apostles had is right here. May that be something that we say, believe, and live. Amen. Our Father, bless thy word. Always communicated through a human instrument that is filled with weaknesses, and so the communication is weak. But it's, it's not bounded by that because thy spirit is so absolutely powerful to take the stumbling words of a human, and it's the spirit working with the word that brings to us those precious and wonderful truths that are our hope, our help. Bless, for Christ's sake, amen. Let's sing from number 316. 316. From Psalm 117. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.